Thank you everybody for uh, sticking around the la next to last lecture. I felt a little bit good about being towards the end because mine is kind of neurology light, but then I also felt a little bit guilty because probably a lot of you have been sitting all day and I'm going to be talking about exercise. So I gave you permission if you want to stand up, wiggle, dance a little if you want. So anytime you want to do that, you can. Um, this is just to remind you that walking is always good. Even if you walk like a neurologist or, you know, <laughs> strange things, this might be even a little better because he's getting some stretching in, things like that too. So um, this topic is huge. I usually sort of delve into things that I want to learn a little bit about, but we could easily have sort of a week-long series on exercise physiology and how it changes the body and things like that. So rather than trying to give sort of an overview or some comprehensive review. I just sort of picked and chose articles that I thought were either sort of groundbreaking or interesting or made you think and say, hmm, that type of thing. So uh, we're going to talk about how exercise affects sort of the normal uh, nervous system. And I'm thinking about it in terms of sort of a, a neurologist, not necessarily a, necessarily a physiatrist or rehab person. Sort of how does it affect the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, the muscles? How does exercise change these things? So we're going to talk about the benefits in um, neurologic problems. How does exercise affect these uh, issues? And then we're going to talk about the uh, negative effects of being sedentary, including sitting. So again, if you want to wiggle a little bit, that's OK. So exercise, I thought you said extra fries. <laughs> So physical activity and learning. This is something that we're seeing in, in school that uh, physical education is being cut, that uh, our kids are, are less and less active sitting on computers, doing video games, they're not going outside, they're not playing. And we're learning that that can really affect how their brain works and how they learn. Um, and in fact, oops, we're not ready for them yet. So um, in the first study, they actually looked at uh, physically active academic lessons. So these are, are lessons where they're actually supposed to get up and move around as opposed to sitting in a chair and trying to be still. And they found that their, their scores improved with that. But just that addition of the physical activity helped them to process better, helped them to, to, to concentrate better. And we've seen sort of the, the ads on television for play 60, 60 minutes of physical activity. Well, that's a lot for some of you know, the kids that I know. But even four minutes of high intensity stuff can improve their attention. So we should be giving kids sort of these intervals where they get up and do jumping jacks, or they get up and move around, they do some other things. And that's going to help them to concentrate and to learn better. So you already saw my, my uh, slides here. That's just you know, to think about kids exercising. And, and I think the bottom was my favorite. So this uh, Mark Tarnopolsky gave a talk at one of our neuromuscular meetings a, a, a few years ago and really kind of blew my socks off, so to speak. Um, he's a researcher up in Canada and actually a, a pediatric neurologist studies things like mitochondrial dysfunction, but he's also sort of shifted into the biology of aging and what it means to age, and particularly things like sarcopenia and muscle wasting and, and, and weakness that develops with, with aging. And so he studied a group of senior citizens, and these senior citizens were not fit senior citizens, um, and did muscle biopsies before the study, study time goes. And these muscle biopsies, we know from, from seeing other, uh, um, other studies that the mitochondria, and the, the power plants of the cells, wear out. And they, they just have these holes in them, and they look ragged, and they look terrible. And they actually analyzed the mitochondrial DNA, and they found huge numbers of mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. And this, the, the power plant of these cells is getting gummed up by these mutations that occur over time. So what they did was they biopsied these individuals, then put them on a six-month exercise regimen. And I included this slide because this is a machine that assists the person in doing the exercise. Many of these people could not even turn the pedals on a stationary bike. But these machines sort of assisted them and got them started. But then it also did something where it made it, as they got a little better, it made it more progressive so that they were always sort of increasing the work that they had to do. And then they re-biopsied them after six months. And 
I don't have the slides to show you. I couldn't, couldn't sneak them anywhere from the internet. But the, um, the, the changes on the biopsies reversed. And you could not tell the muscle biopsies from these exercise individuals from young patients. The mitochondria changed. And you wonder, well, how does that happen? Um, also, their, their strength improved. We can see that the, uh, the strength uh, that they measured went up quite a bit, not quite to, to a young person's level, but a significant difference just over six months, which is, is pretty incredible in, in a really debilitated population. But the, the interesting part to me was what happens on a cellular level. And that when they remeasured these mitochondrial um, changes, these, these, uh, these differences, they were back to youthful levels. And the thought is that they're actually recruiting in uh, stem cells from the muscle spindle, that they come in and they sort of replace the ragged, worn out mitochondria with young, fresh mitochondria. And this is sort of a, an amazing thought that happens in, in older, debilitated individuals. So this is something we're going to hear a lot more about. And hopefully this is what grandma looks like pretty soon, right? So um, brain atrophy. This was something that was in the news a while back. And they said, you know, crossword puzzles may not be that great and, and things like that. But when you go back and look at it, it's, it's, it's a little bit more, um, more to the story. And they looked at a whole bunch of, of people in Scotland, everybody that they could find, a, find that was born in a certain year. And then they did um, MRIs of them. And then they sort of monitored over the next three years and had them fill out surveys about what they did and how they spent their time and how physically active they were. And then they did MRIs again on them three years later. And they found that the ones who reported that they were doing more physical exertion, more physical activity, really didn't have the atrophy that they saw in the, in the other group. And so that their, their conclusion was that this, this physical activity prevented that, um, that shrinking of the brain that we correlate with memory loss and, and reduced function. Um, there was another study that looked at uh, aerobic exercise. Um, and these were, these were fit older individuals. And th they put them on a, an additional exercise program and found that they could sort of change hippocampal volume that you could, you could in increase hippocampal volume, which is something that we also correlate with memory, just by doing a, a physical activity regimen. So not very physically active, a little, little atrophy. <laughs> so physical activity and dementia. So um, they looked at sort of a huge meta-analysis with exercise and um, particularly things like midlife exercise. So this is something, you know, doing in your, your 40s and 50s um, really um, was found to be one of the main things that really could cut risk of dementia by 50%. So almost half of dementia cases can be uh, eliminated or reduced just by getting into a physical activity regimen. Another study looked at that the sort of the critical cutoff there was walking six miles a week um, reduced this. And this was also in Europe over a 13 year period. But again, that's a, a huge reduction in dementia just by walking. So um, depression is also something that is, is um, I thought, fairly interesting in that um, they did a study comparing antidepressants to exercise uh, versus a combination. And you can see that really there, there wasn't a significant difference among the groups. So literally, you can say that exercise is as good as medication and probably helps a little bit as far as the effectiveness of both. So uh, this is, again, something that we, we see a lot in our populations. So neuropathy, this is something that, that gets me excited. And it's one of uh, some work that um, my friends in Utah, Gordon Smith and Rob Singleton, have done. And this, is, this was really a landmark paper. Um, uh, they looked at patients with glucose intolerance, early diabetes, prediabetes, abnormal blood sugars, who had neuropathy symptoms. And they did these skin biopsies on all of them. And this shows the, the small fibers that are involved in the, um, these uh, skin biopsies. And they count them, and they, they determine what the density is. And that is a, a relation. It shows you how much small fiber involvement they have. 
and they assign them to a pretty rigorous exercise regimen, 90 minutes a day. That's quite a bit. But the, the notable thing about this group was being in Utah, there was a, a large population of Mormons. And the, uh, the cooperation rate in this was outstanding. They all did the exercise, they all did the diet, and there was, was very little dropout uh, in the study. And after one year, this was the first study that, that has ever shown any improvement in, in neuropathy. Um, and they actually saw that the, the small fibers were coming back, as well as their, their neuropathic pain was decreasing. And this is really just from, from lifestyle modification. And so this has been sort of a, a landmark study since then. And every year they, they debate between Mayo Clinic and, and Utah whether a diabetic you know, pre-diabetes causes neuropathy. And, and what Gordon's saying now is he says that, that blood sugar control is old school. Uh, fat is where it's at. And he said that, that the, these patients, if you can get them exercising and moving, that's the way to, uh, to combat the, the neuropathy. Yes? The diet, though, is not a specific type of diet. Because not everybody has neuropathy. Is sure. It? Sure. No, it's, it's part of the, the, the whole program. So they were just looking at lifestyle intervention in general, and they, I'm sure they had a very specific, specific regimen for them. But I, I think that the, you know, the, the diet is something that's been, been tried, and the blood sugars have been tried and really failed. You, know, the, you can have excellent blood sugar control, and this small fiber neuropathy is going to get worse if you're not active. If, you don't, if you're not adding the, the exercise component to it, you're just not getting it done. So migraines, um, this is something we've been telling people with migraines to, to, to do, to do more exercise, even though some people say the heat causes it, things like that. So they were comparing 40 minutes of exercise three times a week with uh, topiramate or relaxation exercises and found that all three were effective with no difference among the subgroups. So again, you can say that in this case, exercise was as good as a prescription drug for reducing your, your migraine frequency. And in a separate study, they found that, that when you add exercise to amitriptyline, the combination works better. So this is also so something that's an important component. Parkinson's disease, there's a lot, lot here to talk about, but not, not kind of what I expected. Um, Progressive resistance exercises, things like um, uh, bands or weights, improved motor function. Um, another study looked at musically cued gait training and found that that helped not only your stride length and speed, but also your, your, your timing abilities. And, and this musical, musically cued part was pretty uh, important in that just doing treadmill or just doing gait training gets you some place, but not as far as if you add things to it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, treadmill walking three times a week for five weeks um, actually did better than walking outside. And the, the question is, why, well, why is that? And those improvements even persisted for a month after they stopped walking on the treadmill. Um, there was a, a meta-analysis looking at Tai Chi and found that that helped mobility and balance. Um, and it proves cognitive scores in Parkinson's patients. This was an interesting study that said if you, if you were active and you exercised in midlife, you're significantly less likely to develop Parkinson's disease when you're older. There was also a study looking at, um, oh, actually I will tell you after this. So studies in rats, I oftentimes just kind of skip right by. Um, but this one was interesting. Um, it looked at aerobic exercise, uh, skilled aerobic exercise versus non-skilled aerobic exercise. And what they did with a skilled exercise was they took out some of these rungs irregularly in the, in the running wheel for the rat. And the, the rats that ran on the spinning wheel, their, their cardiovascular function improved and they, they walked a little bit better. But the, um, the ones with the, with the irregular rungs had sig significant changes, including new connections from the, the cerebellum to the, the frontal lobes. And this is sort of a reorganization of the brain just by sort of making it more of a challenge. And, um, and they, they think that probably brain-derived neurotrophic factor may have a role in that, that that is something that's stimulated when you're doing things that, are, that require more concentration, more ability. There was also a, a, a smaller study 
that they did at Cleveland Clinic looking at um, stationary bikes in patients with Parkinson's disease. And um, they found that the ones that were sort of doing the, the standard stationary bikes did okay. They got a little, little more cardiovascular fitness, a little more endurance. Um, and then they compared them to a group that the bike was motorized and made them go 30% faster. And they found leaps and bounds of improvement over the, the standard stationary bike. And that it sort of forced them to do more and it, it, it sort of changed the, the whole dynamic of it and, um, and made, it made significant changes. And this is sort of a, a recurring theme that we're seeing. Multiple sclerosis, not as much as I, I thought that we would find here, but that um, six month exercise program improved walking speed, upper extremity endurance. Um, so it's definitely something we should be, be looking at more. Stroke, um, uh, I didn't want to do a sort of a whole you know, discussion about rehab and stroke, um, but this in, in particular caught my eye about uh, robotic uh, neuro rehabilitation, something called Locomat. And I think it's something that we're looking at for our, our new rehab facilities. Um, and this is, this is pretty exciting to me. Um, what happens is that they, they, you're in a suspended sling basically over a treadmill, but that they attach these robotic components to the legs to make you swing your legs properly, to have a good stride length to do to be able to go faster and to do these, uh, um, you know, a more natural gait. And they compared it to sort of, you know, ordinary rehab or, or rehab just on a treadmill. And the, the, um, they found improvement virtually in everything that they tested, um, including the psychological well-being. So the patients that are getting this, this robotic therapy, even psychologically, seem to be better off. And the, the remarkable thing to me is that even in chronic stroke patients, this is beneficial. So somebody who's had a stroke for years, you put them in the, the, the robot therapy and have them walk in that, and, and they get better, which to me is, is fascinating. So um, this was an interesting study, and, and also one that sort of makes you, th makes you think and say, hmm. So they took normal volunteers, and they put casts on their wrists. Okay, the, the control group, they said, we're going to take it off in four weeks and see what happens. The study group, before they put the cast on the wrist, they said, we want to teach you how to, to think about making a forced wrist contraction, a strong forced wrist contraction. We're going to teach you how to, to think about that. And then they put, them, put the cast on. And then the study group, they had them think about this, this strong wrist contraction for 10 minutes a day. And you know, it's not a lot, but they said, when you're doing that, we really want you to concentrate on that and do that for 10 minutes. And then they took the cast off. And the, um, the control group obviously had a reduction in muscle strength. They're atrophied. They, they lost muscle from not moving it. The study group was half as much weakness, just from thinking about exercising, not actually contracting the muscle. So this to me is sort of, you know, paradigm shifting. How much of this is from the cortex? How much can we be, how much should we be doing from cortical involvement rather than just working the muscles, working the, the nerves, things like that? So neurogenesis is something you're going to be hearing more, more and more about. Okay, this is, this is going to be a hot topic and uh, it's complicated. You know, there's a lot of Star Trek slides involved and things like that, but um, to me it's fascinating. So Increases in growth hormone increase periventricular neural stem cell proliferation. And they found out that, that these, these neural stem cells are produced faster and differentiate faster because of a shortening of S phase. And if you deplete growth hormone in, say, experimental rats, they aren't able to do this. And, um, and we know that exercise also increases uptake of insulin-like growth factor from the bloodstream to the hippocampus and increases CFOS expression. Now CFOS is sort of a hot topic when it comes to generating tumors and things like that, but it also promotes differentiation, proliferation, and survival of neurons and prevents apoptosis. 
So again, this is something where, where you know, what is normal in aging and what is not normal and how, how can we um, modify this. And all of these things are, are affected by exercise. Um, beta endorphin is also a thing that we see rise with exercise. And without it, we can't, uh, we can't uh, differentiate and um, actually form new neurons. Um, so they're saying that the, the exercise may be effective in preventing age-related neurodegeneration in humans. So this is something that we're going to hear a lot more about. And the, the, the researchers that I talked to uh, involving the IGF-1 um, have, have seen this happen in the, in the laboratory where the, um, the, the, in a particular case with these experimental rats, that the um, neurons are degenerating. Uh, they put them on the exercise wheel, and a lot of times this is sort of forced exercise, not you know what the rat feels like. Um, but as they do that, and they re-biopsy, and they look at what's happening, these stem cells come in and surround these degenerating neurons. And um, you know there's there's uh, you know speculation about what's happening there. Are they trying to protect them? Are they replacing them? Are they um, providing these um, beneficial um, trophic factors uh, around these degenerating neurons, um, but it's, it's, I think we're going to hear a lot more about this. So now to the risks of sitting. Um, not to make anybody feel bad or feel guilty, but um, sitting is something that is in the news now too, and it, it, um, it's important that even if you've exercised, if you sit for a long period of time, it may be detrimental. Um, and what we're finding is that as soon as you sit, things like your blood pressure goes up, your um, clotting factors go up, your insulin levels drop, your blood sugars go up, your metabolism slows down, your thinking slows, and um, that happens even in marathoners, because if you run a marathon, then you're likely to be sitting for a period of time afterwards, and, and even in, in people who've done heavy exercise. Um, so what they've been looking at is things like um, uh, people who sit as part of their occupation and at least in the, the North American Indian population there's a double the risk of stroke if you have a sitting job. <laughs> um, Postmenopausal women, um, twice the risk of cancer and more mortality compared to women who do not, do not sit. Um, this is something interesting. Uh, uh, Mayo Clinic developed these ultra-sensitive movement sen sensors, and they track something called NEAT, which is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And what that is, is how much we move while we're sitting. Are, are we wiggling? Are we um, flexing our calves? Are we fidgeting? Are we readjusting in the chair? Things like that. And basically, they found that was good. A higher NEAT score, you, they burned an extra 350 calories per day and were less likely to be obese. So every little bit of movement seems to make a difference. And one of the recommendations now, as far as sitting goes, of every 30 minutes, they say, you can sit 20, but you should stand for seven and walk for three. Um, and so th that's something that you should sort of you know, keep in mind. So is it worse to be sedentary or worse to be obese? Um, Cambridge University looked at this in a large number of people over 12 years, and they found that the, um, the, physical act, the lack of physical activity caused twice as many early deaths as obesity. And so even if you're heavy, being physically active is still beneficial, still protective. And so, you know, we may think this is, is funny, but it's, uh, it's something that we ought to be, be at least promoting. So what, what should we look for in the future? Well, I think data collection is going to be something where we're going to see um, a lot of changes. You know, these things are, are getting to be pretty, pretty popular, and um, even some companies are starting to use them for employees, tracking their movements and, and offering incentives for them to be, be more physically active, because that's going to reduce their insurance. Things, you know, their costs are going to go down. Also. Um, Many employers are finding that the more physically active their, their employees are, the more, um, more productive they are. So they're encouraging things like uh, walking meetings and standing desks because they find that people are more alert, they're, they're more productive, they get more done, and they're, they're actually more creative, um, that you're, you're going to have, have ideas when you're physically active. 
So someday we may be getting specific exercise prescriptions. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough of these studies to say, you know, you need to do X amount of walking, X amount of resistance exercises. But, you know, it certainly would be nice to, to have that sort of prescription available as opposed to giving another, you know, another pill. Um, so being a sort of a physics geek, I had to quote Sir Isaac Newton, a body in motion stays in motion. And don't let this become your <laughs> trainer. No nighttime shin injury inducer. So any questions?